It's wonderful to see all of you here today, and welcome to Brookdale Community College. If you've never been here before, take a look around. This is the college that was built out of a farm. We were originally a thoroughbred farm. We have a statue of a horse named Regret out that way, who was the first filly to win the Kentucky Derby in 1915, and she was foaled here. So that's a point of pride for us. So we welcome you to our family. We welcome you to our home, to our barns. And we hope that today is unbelievably productive. I love seeing that there are representatives from all of our colleges and our four-year partners here to help us clear the clutter so that our students can get the learning that they need when they learn it and achieve their goals in a more timely fashion. Never, never has higher education meant higher stakes than it does now for our students. They're time bound, they're money bound, and it's our responsibility, we have a moral imperative to help move them through so that we can better our communities and better the lives for our students and their families. I'm so pleased that all of you are here to participate in that work. So on behalf of everyone at Brookdale Community College, again, I welcome you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Larry Nespoli with the New Jersey Council of County Colleges. And I want to say to President Maureen Murphy, thank you for hosting us uh, Got 19 great, great community colleges in New Jersey, and Brookdale is just a terrific institution with a great leadership team. And the Marine is uh, setting a standard for community college uh, leadership. She's on vacation today. <laughs> <laughs> so she's got a full day uh, planned with uh, a family, and so we thank her for being here to uh, greet you and thank her for uh, uh, putting her team to work with the former or current community, uh, community college, a Brookdale Community College employee, uh, um, I want to say a bit uh, more about uh, Dr. Uh, Mattis in a second. So uh, I think you all know the Council of County Colleges is the state organization for the 19 community colleges and uh, energy aplenty in the room already. I want to do two things in my brief moment with you and then hand off quickly to uh, Jacenia. One, I want to uh, uh, invite you to give yourselves a pat on the back and I'll say why in a second, lots of reasons, uh, but one in particular. And secondly, I want to uh, really, uh, I hope I can do this uh, really well enough that you really get what a special opportunity uh, uh, Jacenia has uh, presented uh, uh, to New Jersey's community colleges here today. Uh, great that all 19 of our community colleges are represented today. That's not easy to find a date that works for 19 different campus teams and early June is, uh, uh, so it shows the level of commitment and we're here to talk about guided pathways, the exciting uh, new uh, uh, model of uh, reform that's being uh, talked about throughout the country. Uh, pleased that all 19 of our community colleges are here. Pleased too that we have uh, many senior college partners uh, in the room. Guided Pathways, of course, not only uh, uh, is intended to bring focus to the community college portion of the pathway, but also to what comes next. And of course, for many of our students, uh, transfer comes next. So great that uh, many of our senior college partners are here. But also, as you know, for many of our graduates, employment comes next. And we have uh, representatives uh, uh, from the New Jersey Department of Labor here, and they've been great partners as well. Jacini is going to introduce uh, all of these folks uh, 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 later throughout the uh, day. So, first, the pat on the back. Um, commencement time of the year. Um, uh, I get to go to about five of those. Uh, they're all bunched into one and a half week, typically, but what a great time of the year. And uh, here's the good news in terms of the New Jersey Community College commitment to student success. Um, you may remember, um, time flies, five or six years ago now, President Obama and others, Jobs for the Future, Gates, Illumina, AACC, all uh, rolled up their sleeves and said, together, we've got to focus, we, the 1,200-some community colleges, have to focus more on student success. Access, a great thing, the cornerstone still of the American community college movement, but student success equally important. And so President Obama, um, I forget where the speech was, Michigan maybe? Uh, I'm going to say Macomb, it doesn't matter. But set a target of five million, if I remember correctly, that the country uh, would be well served if we could add five million, um, if I don't have the number right, Linda Lamb will get it right for you later, uh, new community college minted graduates by the year 2020. So Linda Lamb, our vice president, as many of you, all of you know her probably, she went to work talking with AAC and took that national goal 
and worked with uh, AACC's uh, uh, staff and took their methodology and brought it to bear in New Jersey and said, okay, New Jersey's portion of that five million is this. Here's what the 19 need to do to hit that target by the year 2020. Well, we're halfway through now. And here's the, the pat on the back part. Um, since we started down this path, we originally, and still do kind of uh, playfully call it the New Jersey Big Ideas Project, kind of uh, minted by our presidents and trustees. We started that in the year that President Obama gave the speech. Punchline, taking too long to get there. Our, your graduates, the number of graduates, are up 40% since that uh, kickoff now five or six, uh, six years ago. To all of you, Pat, Pat's on the back. 40%, that's real. Uh, that's terrific. And of course, why we're here today is there, there's more work to be done, and we all know that. Um, second piece then, what about today? I, again, I hope I can capture the enthusiasm. I'll do my best. But we have three national leaders here. And, and I'm here to tell you that any state would be lucky to have one of them presenting to a statewide audience. It would be a rare privilege to have two of them in the same state at the same moment of time. To have the three of them together is, is really a great opportunity for us in New Jersey. And I said, Yesenia will introduce them more fully, but I want to personally thank uh, Gretchen and, and Rob and Davis, and uh, um, um, you probably know who they are. Jacinia will help you understand uh, more directly in a minute of the great work they're, that they're doing. But they are the best of the best in terms, national, in terms of national community college leaders doing great work in a lot of ways, but here today especially to talk about guided pathways. So um, my quick take on guided pathways, we have props today. We have two copies of this book, Redesigning America's Community Colleges. Delightful summer reading. Jersey Shore reading. Well, I might be stretching it, but I think we're providing a couple of copies of this book to each campus team here today. Yes, did I steal your thunder? Sorry. Um, um, New Jersey has done well what a lot of states have done well, which is to say, led by our presidents, we've identified a half a dozen statewide strategic goals for student success. And we've, we've turned to you to do all of that. Develop, uh, uh, transforming developmental ed, college readiness now projects, statewide student uh, success metrics, engaging our part-time faculty more in these efforts. Uh, um, the gen ed courses, reforming those, strengthening those. And all of those have produced that 40% increase that I just told you about. But what we're here today to talk about is whole institution reform. And that's what Guided Pathways is about. And you're gonna hear our three national leaders say, this is a heavy lift, but it's so spot on. I mean, I've read this book. It just captures where this exciting American community college movement is now 50 some years into this uh, uh, movement. And, and so our game plan here today, in short, is uh, twofold. One, this day is gonna have great value in and of itself. And we're so pleased. We've learned Jacinia is a, a, a hard person to say no to, that 19 of you uh, are here, because uh, there, there will be great value here today. But we want you to be listening and, and, and looking with a, a lens to what comes next, and you'll hear more about this. But um, we are going to uh, deploy a cohort, cohort model, <clears throat> and we're going to tee this up based on what you hear today. We're gonna, going to be inviting we can probably, uh, with this Center for Student Success and the Kresge funding that it provides, we can support probably a cohort of six or seven colleges as early as the fall to really get into this in a collaborative cohort way. So think about that as you're listening here today. And if the interest is more than six or seven of you, well, we'll figure that out. We'll figure that out as well. I think uh, other states uh, are using a, a, a same model. So welcome, thank you for what you do. Um, never been a more exciting time for community colleges and community college leaders uh, making a difference. And let me introduce now a, a young woman who really is making a, a difference. And help me uh, brag about her and uh, Lou Venturelli as well. Uh, great that we're at Brookdale Community College. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Jacinia Mattis, uh, uh, I knew her from her work at Brookdale, but also met her 
uh, when she was a graduate student. Some of you know about this Rowan uh, University. I hope most of you do. Doctor of Program at Community College Leadership. Monica Reed Kerrigan is here, who's uh, uh, our lead faculty member at Rowan. Um, is there still time to register for, uh, to uh, apply for this uh, coming fall? Uh, raise your hand, Monica. Talk to me if you didn't apply and you're still interested. We'll, uh, we know the president, we'll figure it out. Um, forgive me for that, Monica. But uh, in, in any case, uh, uh, Jacinia is a special talent and uh, we're so pleased. Uh, I think uh, Maureen has left uh, now, but uh, on loan to us, um, for the duration of this Kresge uh, uh, grant. It uh, um, gives me great pleasure to, where's the Brookdale gang? Let's uh, uh, welcome Jacinia to the podium. And Lou too, this is for you, with a round of applause for the great work that she's done already. Hello. I, he did steal my thunder, um, but I did wanna say that I know some of you have not received your two copies. I will get them to you, I promise. Uh, we sort of wanted to get the program started, so I have a list I am keeping track. But if I do forget you, do not be shy. Find myself or Lou, and we'll be sure to get you your copies. Um, I am really excited about today. It took a lot of planning, and of course, nothing ever happens um, you know, alone. And so a big thank you to Lou and to all the staff at NJCC, and also to Daniel, who's out there, and Jessica staffing the table for us. Um, you know, the more I think about guided pathways and I think about the fact that community colleges, while we're at the forefront of the conversations nationally, we still have a lot of work to do in the sense that, you know, the, the conversation when a student um, says, I'm, I'm choosing to go to community college, and they may be from an affluent area, the sentence that follows is, do you have to save money? And so I think that we need to start shifting from you know, yes, we are affordable, and that's wonderful, but we are also excellent. And I am so proud to be able to work with all 19 of you. It has been like a dream for me. And I want you to all think about in your own life how much you have changed, how much you have evolved, how much you have grown, and think about how much your college perhaps has not. And that is the reason why Guided Pathways is needed. We need to continue to change as our students change, as our demographics change, as our nation changes. And so while I know that many of our sector is doing great work and we will continue to do great work, I also hope that we can bring it to the next level. And for those of you in the room, I encourage you, I challenge you, it is a moral imperative that you go back and that you share this with the rest of your campus. Let them know why it's important and continue to be a champion for change. Thank you very much. And now I would like to bring Dr. Gretchen Schmidt, Schmidt up to the podium. She is a ball of fire. She will energize you and um, she's fabulous. Let's welcome her. Um, I, my name is Gretchen Schmidt. I work at an organization in Boston called Jobs for the Future. And we're a nonprofit think tanky kind of organization and we work um, uh, in, in many different settings in many different sectors. I work in a very small team within JFF that works on post-secondary state policy. So I am a community college person at heart. I actually have known Maureen Murphy for years. Maureen Murphy was a vice president in Virginia when I worked at the system office in Virginia. And so I have worked um, both at the institutional level, the state level, and now I do this work. And so I have the fantastic opportunity to be able to look at this through many lenses. And so I'm gonna, um, my job is a very brief one, although I actually don't do anything very brief, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, I'm setting the context for this a little bit, and I'm also gonna talk about what the other student success centers in the country are doing. Um, New Jersey is not the only student success center that is funded by the Kresge Foundation. These success centers are intermediaries that are funded in seven different states. Um, by the Kresge Foundation, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the arc of that work and also what the other centers are doing so you can see how New Jersey fits in the context of this. I am also actually, my largest job here is to provide color commentary and snarky comments in the back of the room when Robin Davis are presenting. So you will see that often and that's my job. We all travel together all far too often and um, I gladly play that role wherever we present together. And so how do we all get here? You know, this work didn't happen in a vacuum. So 
you know, that this guided pathways work, we had to be somewhere to get here. It was a process, it was a journey, it was the arc of the work, and it started with achieving the dream. Achieving the dream was 11 years ago now, folks. 11 years ago, Achieving the Dream started. And when I came to Virginia, in the first year I was in Virginia, Virginia was the round one Achieving the Dream state. And so when I came to Virginia, we had just started Achieving the Dream. We had three, four colleges participating in ATD. We were in a system office, so we should have actually had good data. We had one student information system, one learning management system, and was in a centrally governed state. You know what they did? They implemented PeopleSoft 23 different ways at 23 different institutions in a 24th way at the system office. That means we had a lot of data and the data meant nothing. Nothing. You couldn't make any generalizations or any conclusions about the data. And so we had to do our reporting for the first part of achieving the dream and we looked at our data and then we showed our colleges the data and the colleges all said that isn't our data. And so then you have like this, he said, he said, you know, like kind of conversation about whose data is right and whose data is wrong. And we spent the first two years in achieving the dream in Virginia developing a data dictionary. Now that's fun, sexy work if you've ever had it, right? Like, so putting all your IR folks in a room, all your A&R folks in the room, all your back office people in the room for two solid years and fighting over data definitions and elements in PeopleSoft. So in element 3.1a on the screen that goes after control, I'll delete 14 times, this is how we're using that definition. It took us two years of that to even get data that we could use. So you can't have this guided pathways conversation about how students enter into your institution, move through your institution, and come out the other side and where they go without that conversation. And we wouldn't have had that conversation without achieving a dream. There was no impetus to have that conversation. That's why Virginia allowed PeopleSoft to be implemented 24 different ways under one learning manage one student information system. And from achieving the dream, we figured out that DevEd was a wasteland that our students could not, in the structure that existed at that point in time, six years ago, get through developmental education. And the lower they started, and the, the fact that they came from underrepresented populations, the less chance they had of getting through. So we looked at the data. In Virginia, if you were an African American male, and you were three levels down in Dev Ed, you had a 0% chance of completing, zero. Now, I don't know about you all, but like, that's like educational malpractice, right? Like that's, you come, they come in, they give you the money, you know, now you know, right? Before you didn't know, because we didn't look at it that way, but now you know. So now you have a, no, you have a 0% chance of them completing. When you know better, you gotta do better, right? So that's where the dev ed work came about. In the places that did large scale dev ed reforms, it was that they had the data early on to realize that our students were not getting through dev ed. They just weren't. And if they were getting through, it was the students at the highest level and they were the ones that were misplaced anyway. And they probably shouldn't have been in dev ed. And so they got through, but we kept them longer than they had to and we kept them off a path longer than they had to because really they shouldn't have been where they were. So about how many years ago, Davis Jenkins, Davis Jenkins wrote an article called Get With the Program. What year, Davis? I'm giving you credit all over the country for this presentation. You love when I do this, right? So get with the program was with Virginia data. That's the big secret, like all CCRC studies. The unnamed state in get with the program was Virginia. And so we see a preview of get with the program and Davis calls us up and we're on this preview call for, with get with the program. And we had just finished like revolutionary dev ed reform. I was like bleeding in the back from faculty throwing arrows at me. We were exhausted. We had just done this dev ed reform. And Davis says, oh, the dev ed doesn't matter. What matters is the students aren't in programs. I was like, don't tell me this. It's, it's your, it, don't tell me it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk. What? <laughs> And so Davis and I fought for a year in public and not in public, in bars and in presentations and all over the place about this because I was like, no, 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 no. We know that this is going to be it. We're going to get them through. It's going to be better. And in the end, as Davis loves to hear, because I will say it again in a big room of people, what is it like 400 people in this room? Davis Jenkins was right. And it is about getting the students into the program. And it's not about the dev ed. 
in that we put too much focus on DevEd and not enough focus about connecting the students to their programs and what the end goal of that program is and how that program matters to the student, how that program matters in connection to the workforce, how that program matters in connection to transfer institutions and receiving institutions in your state. So then completion by design came around and completion by design is still in its final implementation stages. I don't know in Inside Higher Ed if any of you saw the article on Sinclair Community College yesterday. Sinclair is one of the original completion by design colleges in Ohio. And so completion by design took get with the program and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded a very transformative effort at nine community colleges in the country to restructure around this idea of guided and structured pathways. To take that information that CCRC and Davis wrote in that was actually really revolutionary at the time and say, okay, what is it gonna look like if we restructure institutions this way? And so that's been going on. We are the state policy partner in that at Jabs for the Future, so we work with the states to make, to help change the policy environment so that this works better at the institutional level. So this is, and now you're starting to see the data, and Davis and Rob will show you examples. There's a fantastic example from our friend Marsha Ballinger from Lorraine Community College, and Davis and Rob have it in their presentation for the work that she's doing and how she's connected it to cost and actual hard cost savings for the students, what it means if students go through in a structured pathway at Lorraine and into the four-year institution. And so Guided Pathways to Success is another CCA um, initiative around structured pathways. And there is a growing pathways movement in the country. That's why you're all here, because if you didn't think this, this mattered, I promise you, you all wouldn't be in a basement on a June morning at Brookdale Community College. As lovely as it is here, this wouldn't be your first choice of places to be. And so we know this is intuitive, right? Like it feels right, it feels like what we should be doing, but now we're gonna have the data. So there are seven student success centers in the country. The first two were in Arkansas and Michigan. And they were funded by the Kresge Foundation because they were focus states from the Kresge Foundation. And the Kresge Foundation had actually put a lot of money into achieving a dream in those two states. But because the states were decentralized and there was no centralized or coordinating structure in that state, that the, the learnings and the best practices in the conversation and collaboration like this kind of work couldn't exist in those states because there was a vacuum because there was no centralized structure to do it. So they got the idea, actually the idea came from this gentleman named Ed Franklin, who Larry and I know very well in Arkansas, who said, I need someone or something to manage all of my, and connect and leverage all of my student success work. Because it's all happening in isolated towers at different institutions and nobody knows what somebody else is doing so they can't learn from each other and they can't share and there's no professional development that's available for these people to learn and grow together. So Kresge funded the first one in Arkansas. And right after that, because Kresge is in Michigan, they funded one in Michigan. And so, and as you can see, the first four were in very decentralized states, Ohio and Texas. So the association heads there went to Kresge and said, we see the validity in this. Can you help us start and create funding to seed this in our states too? So four existed off the bat over like a two year, two and a half probably Larry period of time, those four student success centers were funded by Kresge. And some of them leveraged local money to make the work bigger and um, have increased staff support. And then Kresge stepped back because they started getting one off requests all over the country for student success centers and they had no vehicle to decide where one should go and what they should be doing and why it would be value in one place and not in another place. So Kresge paid us at Jobs for the Future to develop a framework of what a student success center is, what a student success center isn't, what the role should be in the state, and a selection process, an RFP process for how they would be chosen. We did that when the New Jersey Center was funded. We ran the RFP process. 24 states submitted initial letters of intent for a student success center. 24 states. States where you wouldn't think that they'd want one. North Carolina, Virginia, Florida, Tennessee, places with very centralized structures. Places in very decentralized places, like places that don't play in the student success game. Idaho, Missouri, Oklahoma. 
And in the end, we invited 10 institutions to 10 places to submit full proposals. It was a very competitive process, and three centers were funded as a cohort at the same time, California, Connecticut, and New Jersey. You couldn't pick three states that are as different in the country as California, Connecticut, and New Jersey. But what it was about was a commitment to this kind of work, the convening, the connection, the structure, the infrastructure, the, to being on the leading edge of these kinds of conversations. So Jacinia and Lou and their partners in crime in other states, we, we run a learning community of all these folks that work together and learn from each other. And so as you see, all of these institutions except California, because California is another animal, so we can't talk about what happens in California, because I swear to God, everybody told me it was crazy in California, and I believe them, but then I went there, and it's really, really crazy there. And so they have a hard time moving things. It doesn't move as fast. And so, but you'll see that Arkansas, Michigan, Ohio, Texas, Connecticut are all running similar pathways, initiatives, in a very similar model to the model that they're, you're using here in, in, in New Jersey. And they're in different starts and stops in different places. So Arkansas and Michigan are out the gate first. They started earlier. Connecticut, Ohio has been part of CBD, but they're developing a structure that's very much like this. Um, Texas has been doing, um, is doing full-scale implementation of um, new mathways, which is Uri Treisman's um, Quantway, Statway, spin-off project in Texas, and they are also doing different kind of structured pathways works across all of the colleges in Texas, which is a behemoth. And Connecticut has started this work and we'll have had an initial meeting like this last fall, last spring, with Davis and I keynoted, and then they are starting with a cohort-based structured model like here in the fall. So this is, this is a movement. This is happening in other places in the country. The thing that is benefits the Student Success Center is that you can get technical assistance that you would not get at your individual institution because Robin Davis can't go to all 19 of your colleges. And then the 58 colleges in Texas, and the 13 in Connecticut, and the 30, 23 in Ohio, they can't do it. So this leverages that opportunity. And so I hope you see it as that. And I hope you take advantage of it. And I hope for those of you that come out the gate in the first cohort that you take this seriously. This is really hard work. No one here is gonna tell you that this is easy. But I'll tell you that there's a thought, one, almost 1,100 community colleges in the country. There's only so many technical assistance providers and people that can help you do this. And so if you can't do it or you don't want to do it or you don't believe in it or whatever, this is what I said in Connecticut, Davis will tell you, it's okay, but don't do it then. Like, but if you're gonna do it, do it. Come prepared, know it's a heavy lift, do it because it's gonna be better for your students and it's gonna change the role of community colleges nationally. And that, that's what this kind of transformation is gonna to lead to. So Gretchen gave a brilliant overview of what's happening nationally. I want to frame this in terms of what's happening to us locally. Focus here is on uh, helping students succeed, helping students learn, focusing on teaching and learning in a, in a more strategic way maybe than we have in the past. But to do this, we gotta, we gotta survive as, as, as businesses, as colleges and universities. And I'm really glad that the universities are here too because we're arguing, we're gonna argue that this is not something community colleges or universities can do by themselves. It's got to be a partnership. And so we want to briefly talk about the, the new business environment or the current business environment, which uh, is certainly the case in New Jersey. As states uh, decrease their funding for uh, uh, higher education, especially in certain states with governors running for president. Uh, they, they can't fight wars, so they figure they'll take a big whack out of higher education. That proves that they're a man or a woman, I guess. But for whatever reason, uh, it's not clear to me, as states cut uh, uh, funding for higher ed in, in community colleges and broad access public universities, tuition goes up. And of course, during that, this period, uh, uh, family incomes have not gone up. So uh, this means more expense for the student. Federal financial aid, which uh, you know exploded after the boom, is leveling off. And even though it it it, it increased, uh, you know more students were after that pot. So actually, the per student, uh, uh, and there are many more restrictions to it. anyone in financial aid here. Okay, 
So increasingly, uh, you know, uh, the, the limitations on Pell eligibility, the, uh, uh, the uh, satisfactory academic progress, and now increasingly they're really tightening down. I guess it's always been the case, but my understanding, I hear from financial aid people, you, that financial aid ain't going to fund courses in, unless they're in a student's program of study. So this is driving, this is a big driver behind this. Again, we're concerned about teaching and learning in the classroom, but we got to help this guy make sure that your students can get there, okay? And we will talk about some ways that colleges we know of, none in this room, have responded to that financial aid by creating some certificates and degrees that are rather generic and don't lead to anything. Right. Um, which don't actually, not that anyone in here has done that, I'm sure you haven't, but we've seen that a lot of places. And, and it, this is one of those th perverse incentives that my po policy friends talk about. When you put a policy in a place that seems to make some sense, sometimes the response to it actually makes the problem worse. And so as we talk about the structure and guided pathways today, we're talking about, as Davis always said, starting with the end in mind of actually getting to jobs that lead to, 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 lead to family sustaining wages, whether that's before transfer, going directly into the workforce, or after transfer. High school population we know, so this is a big thing for universities who've relied on recent high school graduates as their main market in places like Jersey, even places like Texas is, is declining. And the growth area within our K-12 is among students who are not well prepared for college. Uh, pressures to dump ed, dev ed, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, increasing accountability, even as states are, you know, uh, cutting funding for higher ed, they want more from you. Um, and there's a lot of talk about performance funding. In, our view, in my view, tuition, rising tuition, is the main source of performance funding because uh, as students and families pay more of their own money for uh, higher education, they're going to want and need a return, and they're going to want to need it quickly. And it can't just be a, a, a fake certificate either, a, a quick certificate. It's got to be something that employers and senior institutions, universities, will accept as quality. And I'm, by the way, just to do it, the other side of that is on your, your side is trying to run colleges and universities. I think this tuition has been performance funding since as long as we've had tuition. Right, and this is something that I I'm not a big. This is, whenever there's a room of more than five people, I usually state I'm not a big fan of performance funding models. You get the logic behind them, but in practice, you're moving around the same deck chairs on the Titanic, and you're just kind of shifting some stuff over here and here. But you've always had tuition as performance funding, and one of the things that we talk about when we talk about uh, your high school population is declining. If you're going to get increased revenues from tuition, it's going to be from the students you already have staying with you longer and getting more toward degrees. I mean, there's a return on investment that's based, in, you already have the source of internally. It's from the students who actually aren't getting very far with you right now. Although I think you can do more to build, and we'll talk about this, yeah. build the supply chain from the high schools. I think the yield for community colleges of dual enrollment programs is really crappy. Um, and we'll talk about that specifically. And Davis talks so, a lot about the return on investment to the student on this front, too. Right. So uh, in the past, community colleges and broad access four years have been able to attract students by offering very accessible, low-cost access to higher education. But now, given that, that the cost, even for community colleges, for the average family is, is increasing, and the burden on the family rather than the, the, the public is, is, is increasing, uh, that's not going to fly anymore. And especially given the demographics, the, the, the workplace, and the, the, the economy's improving. So they build a supply chain, and we, we'll talk about this in a minute. So, so this is what this is about. When we speak to presidents, this is what this is about fundamentally is enrollments. And also when we speak to faculty, this is getting students into your classroom who are ready to learn and, and who can finance their educations. Um, so... In order to recruit students now, in the past we had low cost access, now we have to have programs that lead somewhere. And what students want is ultimately career advancement and increasing that means getting a bachelor's, not always, but getting a bachelor's degree. And even in, in technical programs where I and Rob have spent a lot of time and we work on these and we're not knocking those, we show uh, research CCRC does that these have good returns. But even in those technician jobs that pay well, in order to move up into technical management, technical sales, you're going to need that bachelor's degree. Not right away, but eventually. And so this is this path that we're talking about creating. And so everything, if the student wants advancement in the labor market and degrees, especially uh, you know, degrees of value, let's say, 
That's what our focus has to be. And that's what we got to organize everything around as students look at us. And uh, in the past, we've sort of, you know, students have come to us because we're cheap and accessible. Now we have to actively recruit students and not just to Rowan University or Brookdale Community College. We have to recruit them into our programs like the proprietaries do, like, like privates do. We have to market these programs and show uh, how much it costs and where they lead in terms of what students want. Bachelor's degrees uh, or credentials of value and then ultimately bachelor's degrees and, and careers. And we can't do this alone. Rowan's strategy is very much relying, I gather, on one hand increasing front end uh, 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 standards so you get more but in the back end working strategically with community colleges to fill in uh, uh, not not fill in numbers but to generate students who actually we know from our research and others do very well once they've been through the community college but not just cherry pick them they have to have come through and uh, completed a substantial uh, amount I'm looking at, at Monica uh, my our, my former colleague who's now at Rowan so so uh, a shameless plug, although with Larry and Jacinia and I, I don't need to, but uh, so we've summarized uh, these ideas in a, in a book I wrote with my colleagues, uh, Tom Bailey, who heads CCRC and Shauna Jaggers. And the main uh, argument is that community colleges, uh, we, we basically tried to address the problem of looking at these initiatives like Achieving the Dream, Developmental Education Initiative, why weren't they why were they just having effect and success for small numbers of students and not moving the needle on student success overall? So we stepped back and basically looked at the, how community colleges are organized and what we see is an institution extremely well organized to provide low cost access, not well organized to, uh, to help students get in, choose and get a, choose a program or a, a program of study that is suited to their interests and aptitudes and goals, actually, and help them see what the options are and successfully complete that program in a timely way and most efficiently for them and, and, and the taxpayer and proceed to further education and careers. And to, to do that requires, like Rob said, start with the end in mind, where the end is the careers and whatever education is needed to get into and advance in those careers. Start with the end in mind and build the program backwards, not from the high schools up or from dev ed up, but build the programs backwards. And that, a lot of this work that we've done has relied heavily on dev ed and math and English and the advising staff, the student affairs staff, we've got to centrally involve the faculty in this. So this has come out of uh, a lot of research that we and others uh, uh, have done, Rob, Monica, many others, uh, Deb Bragg throughout the country, on looking at the student experience in community colleges from the, and, and broad access four years, from the time that they consider college to when they first enter and as they move along. Most of the, the, the focus to date has been on the second phase, the entry phase. The, on, so with this focus on developmental education, initial advising, first year experience. Less, uh, uh, less on this connection phase. And actually there's recent research from University of Virginia showing that community colleges and four years lose a lot of students. Uh, this particular study uh, found that in a, looking at high school graduating classes in June, of those students who intended to go to the community college in the fall, 40% did not show up, okay? Now, many of those students will show up later, but we know that delayed entry is really hurtful to them. Actually, what's interesting about, and there were similarly high, I think it was 25% didn't show up who intended to go to the four years. So right there, the prime population that, you know, is the easiest to serve, we're, we're, we're hemorrhaging students even before they get in the door. Okay. And I think we would probably, at least, I think I, I can speak for Davis here, one of the re reasons that we think this is happening is the lack of a clear connection between what they see in front of them and what they need to want to do in the real world, right? We, one thing we haven't done a great job at is making that connection for them. And he's going to show you some slides and data later that will be really uh, kind of transformational as we think about what do you put in front of students to make them see the value of this? I mean, this is another, by the way, this is another thing I use as an example for why we all say we have that, a large number of part-time students, right? Students are working 40 hours a week. They're all part-time students. We can't, we can't get them through fast. So why are they part-time students, right? There's a financial side to that. There's a financial stability side. But I'd argue pretty strongly there's also a, they're not all in because they don't know what they're getting, 
right? They don't know what they're getting, and they also don't see themselves making progress, right? They come in, they take a course, they take another course, they take a third course. They don't know where they're going. You don't know where they're going. The most effective programs for working adults, including low-income working yeah. adults, are compressed, structured, and have a clear outcome in terms of careers and further education. And like David said earlier, one of the things I often ask folks is, why, why are proprietaries so popular? Think about that for a second. Why are proprietaries so popular, right? Well, one is they promise you're going to get through fast. Okay, they don't always deliver on that, right? They, I'm saying why are they popular, not why do they work. Why are they popular is they promise that you'll get through fast. And they're, you, you don't sign up for courses or you sign up for programs. You want to do X? Come here, you can do X quickly, right? There's a value proposition built into that. But I got to tell you, most of them aren't seeing with you. And because we haven't put it to them in the same way, and one of the slides he's going to show you later is going to really make a case that we could actually do this a lot better than the proprietaries, because whatever you say about our completion rates, on average, they're better than most proprietaries' rates, and it is a better return on their investment, because they cost much less. So this notion of making the case to, pr to prospective students and your current students who aren't all in either, right? that you do get something here, here's what you get. We're gonna help you get there. You're gonna have to work hard. But there's a proposition here for them that gives them an internal. We've not thought, they're not thinking of it in these terms. They see the path, they see the end goal, and they can commit more of their time and emotional and intellectual resources as well as financial, so. So what this requires is not, you know, in Achieving the Dream and some of these others, we've looked at broad progression of students through college. This requires us to focus on programs of study and helping students choose and successfully enter a program of study. Not get, get into dev ed, but satisfy the gateway course requirements for business or for social and behavioral sciences or for uh, healthcare and the like. And that requires starting with the end in mind, which we call here completion, but it's really, completion is not just completion of the credential, but what the student does afterwards with it in terms of further education and advancement in the labor market. A certain person in the back of the room who just spoke in front of you is fond of saying that uh, exactly 0% of your students come here to major in dev ed, <laughs> right? They're not here for that reason, and by the way, about 1% of them are here to major in math and English. And those are the first two things they are subjected to, thrown into. And it goes back to the same connection, by the way, that we were just talking about. They're not here to take math and English. They may need math and English. Don't get mad at me yet, math and English instructors. They need math and English. They need it. They're not here for that. And so when we, the first thing we tell them when they get here is, by the way, students who thought they weren't college material, many of them think I'm not college material. The first thing we do, we confirm that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Congratulations, you're not college material. What are the two subjects you hated most in high school? Math and English. You know what you're going to do first? You're going to take a math and English test, and then we're going to tell you you're not college material, and then we're going to go subject you to this thing that has no connection to what you want to do. I mean, think about the psychology of that. I'm a psychologist. For a second, what it does to students, right, who already thought they weren't college material, right? They're already on that slide out. And what he's talking about here is, and you can see what happens, but the mindset, I think this is, the, as much as the numbers, is the mindset we, could, we put right away into students. So yeah, this is confirming what they told you in high school, especially if you're low income or a student of color, which is you're not college material, okay? Uh, we present you with this test, which is of really questionable validity, even if you look at the, the test companies, un unethically bad research that they've done, validity studies, and my colleagues have done very good studies showing that high school grades, much better predictor uh, of, of student success in high school. This is the yield that you get in math for of uh, 64,000 uh, students, 11% uh, pass gatekeeper math in five years. This is for English, a little better, but still less than a third. I would like to state for Davis for the record in the tape that all testing companies in New Jersey are of the highest level of ethics. <laughs> We're talking uh, about testing companies in other states right now. Don't get me going, man. Don't get me going. I'm trying not to bite the hand that feeds me, but... Uh, so throughout the country, there have been efforts to uh, provide, uh, to think about this in a different way, to think about the goal of not getting through remediation, but taking and passing the key college level courses, and to do this in a way that's much more integrated, that's offered where the support is in a, instead of offered in a prerequisite way that essentially mimics them going through high school again in the very stuff they hated, I mean, at least you guys could do prom or something fun, but no, you do math and English, you send them. So these efforts are putting students into college level courses, 
providing wraparound supports. And here's a very large scale, it's called a pilot, last fall in, among all the Tennessee community colleges uh, in, to provide this co-requisite support for students in college level math. Students, community college students mainstreamed into math, college level math, the 12% is the pass rate that uh, in one term, that, or in one year actually, that you got in the past in Tennessee Community College. 12% of entering students took and pass uh, college level math. Under this pilot, which they're now scaling to all community colleges, 63% of students pass, of, of first time students pass, and the red bar is all students, okay? And here's how the math and English break out in terms of of ACT. So talk about uh, another testing company. So look, even at the, while it is true that the higher ACT score students uh, are more likely to pass, even at the 14 level, uh, you got uh, 37, more than a third of students in one term taking and passing college math versus 4%, almost zero in, in the past among similar cohorts. Here it is for English. And in this case, I didn't include 12 and 13 for math because there were, weren't that many numbers, but even at 12 and 13 ACT, I don't know what that translates. Let's go back to the last one for a second to the math one. I just want to make a quick point here. A lot of this has to do with the question we're asking ourselves when we look at data, right? Because when no, most people, if we didn't have the uh, blue slide on there, we didn't have the yellow bar on there, right? And you would look at this and say, because the, the lens through which we've seen things in DevEd historically is mainly about courses, right? And so you would look at that transfer level course and a 37% success rate and go, that's way too low. We can't put these students in that course. It's only got a 37% success rate, right? It's a very logical way of looking at that one data point. It can tell you, ask yourself, how many of them are getting through when you do it the old way? And the answer is four. Right, so 37 is not great. By the way, I'm, Tennessee will tell you they're going to work on something to improve that, and they've yeah. done a lot of things around the state with this co-requisite model to try to get these. And this is not just taking a course. Another variable here, by the way, is the course is not intermediate algebra for most of these students. It's quantitative reasoning or statistics, right? So there's a lot of fusion between the math way, stat way, quant way, and this. But think about the way you look at your data for a second, because if you looked at that 37% and put only that number in front of people, you would very likely conclude, since we've done this for the history of time, that success rate is too low. We can't have those students in that course. But what are we comparing it to is what happens when we do it the old way. And that 4% is incredibly consistent. That's across colleges, states, and the entire system. So we've got to be careful. They even said this earlier, what problem are we trying to solve? We're trying to get more students through the transfer level math course of high quality. They didn't change standards here at all, by the way. And another thing about this data is it's two and four year colleges. This data right here is two years, but they also did it for the four year colleges too with very similar data. Right, so this wasn't a fix the community college. They're doing the same thing at the four year level. They're doing them together. Yeah. What I like about this though, this as Rob alluded, they have not declared victory. That you know, they see this as possible. And what this really has done is expose what we were doing, you know, that the dev ed system, this gauntlet of, was not working in the past. But that doesn't mean that what they're really gonna focus on is how can we strengthen uh, co-requisite support or, or at least aligned uh, support, especially for the students at the lower end. So for students who make it through or who don't need dev ed, uh, most students come in without uh, a clear idea of what they want uh, for college and careers. They don't even know what the options are. And when you think about it, how could they? I mean, part, uh, isn't that why partly or mainly they're, they're here at, at college? Uh, most, the majority, the vast majority want a bachelor's degree because society, their counselors and others have told them that. But they don't know what that means. They don't know what credits are. They don't know what transfers are. They certainly know what an elective versus a major credit is, which is a big thing. It's to read the fine print. That's a biggie right there. And we've done research. Uh, there's a, uh, we'll talk about it in, in a minute. So what do we tell them? Well, you know, to give yourself the most flexibility, you should get your gen eds out of the way. And here they are. Um, Rob does this thing you, using a university thing, and I mean, it's like, you, some of these words like letters, is that like studying mail carrying? I mean, what, I, I yeah. mean, what, is, what are these things? These words mean nothing to most students right. who, are, who are not versed in the lexicon of higher ed. And it, it, again, it goes to the same psychology I was talking about earlier. 
when you start thinking, you, when you came in worried that you were college material, and now there's all this, the nomenclature, you can't find the information you want. David's going to show you. It's right here. Yeah, it's right here. It's all, it's all good. Um, and by the way, we'll tell you a story later about some faculty at Miami-Dade who were tasked with um, actually laying out the ideal pathway for a student wanting Just to transfer. tell them now. I'll tell them now. They, they asked the, we'll tell you later. No, we'll keep you good. It'll be after the break. Come back after lunch. Um, they, they actually asked the faculty, so this was during the guided pathway stuff we were doing. They had 28 faculty in a room from roughly the 28 biggest departments, and they were wrestling with this idea of how to put, uh, whether and how much structure they should put into their, into their redesign approach. And at some point, we found out later it was actually the union president. So one of the things that comes up in a lot of these discussions is how can we do any of these changes when we have unions? Miami-Dade, very strong union. The union president asked the biology faculty to leave the room. And they asked the other 26 faculty to use, on, using only tools available to students to identify the ideal transfer pathway over a two-year pathway to transfer to, was it Florida International, I think? Yeah. Florida International University, they had a three-hour meeting. At the end of three hours, they couldn't do it. These are 26 people who worked at the college and were faculty at the college, right? This is a really good exercise. The career programs are often very well structured. The problem there is that we don't have advising to help students even know that they exist and the kinds of, because, because we don't tell them that there are jobs for technicians, you know, out there. But for the transfer area, we dump them in this gen ed, ed swamp. And the results we get, uh, not surprisingly, of the million and a half students who enter higher education through community colleges every year, the vast majority intend to get a bachelor's degree. I'm not saying they know what that means, but that's their intent. Uh, only a quarter transfer uh, to a four-year institution in five years. And 30, a little bit more than a third get a degree before they transfer, which is problematic because uh, uh, many of those students uh, don't uh, uh, actually end up getting a bachelor's degree or getting one right away. So if they haven't gotten a certificate or associate degree before they transfer, they're out there on the labor force essentially looking like a high school graduate, which they're not. And my, Clive, my colleague Clive Belfield has quantified using data from North Carolina what this means in dollars and cents to the student and their family and to the taxpayer. And going through community colleges and getting your associate degree is a good, a very good deal for both in terms of labor market returns using actual data. And so, you know, we, we've alluded to these. Students are really confused about this. Uh, the Public Agenda, our colleagues at Public Agenda did focus groups with uh, students who had transferred from Ivy Tech and Vincennes to each of the six regional Indiana University campuses. These were transfer students. Uh, they did 50 focus groups in all six campuses because they didn't want the six universities to say, well, our campus is different. And in every campus, most of the students who had transferred had taken courses that the, they were told would transfer and in some cases walked across the parking lot to the university and found that, well, we'll take it for uh, elective credit, but this doesn't transfer to your major. And do you know what your major is? No. Well. We know that if you don't take your, you don't know what your major is long before you're transferred, as we were talking about, it's almost guaranteed with a Rowan University, even the universities admit it, that uh, uh, you're almost guaranteed to have to take extra courses. And these are people who can't afford it. And they were saying things like, I should have known the advisors, well, well-meaning, you know, there's no one's talking to them and, and the, there's too much information. I should have known that these institutions were in competition with one another. I should have known that the only accurate information I could get was from whom on what would actually transfer. Was from the chair of the department at the university to which I want to transfer. So, you know, students are coming out of the Trenton and Newark and Middlesex schools knowing that they got to go to Rowan and and set up, or, or New Brunswick, and set up, a, you know, a, a, a meeting with the chair of biz, the dean of business, and say, "What do I got to take at the community college to get through?" This is what. But the subtext of this was, which is really discouraging, is a, I'm tired because I've spent a lot of money and I haven't gotten out of it, and b, I, I, I realize I'm not college material. So they're taking what is a systemic problem, and because they're, uh, you know. Uh, not wealthier people who would blame the system, they're blaming themselves. And it really has, uh, Kay McClenney has, uh, and Ceci has a lot of video that, you know, it's disheartening after a while, but you see the, the tenacity of the students getting through. So 
what we have is in both community colleges and broad access institutions, even though the majority of students show up uh, not having a clear idea of what they want to do or even what the options are, I mean, how could they? We, we make career and college planning optional. The paths are unclear, there are too many choices. Students are not building skills across the curriculum. Assessment is used not, to, not by faculty to learn where, what students are weak in, but to sort them out into college ready and not. And we run students through this prerequisite uh, you know, gauntlet uh, of, 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 of DevEd, which the research shows does not work uh, for students. Um, and uh, we don't monitor their progress. This is one I like to ask the question of this. What are the only two times most colleges right now communicate to students about their progress towards the degree? Graduation and suspension. So they're on their way out because they're done, or they're on their way out because they're done, right? Because <laughs> what are your rates of getting people off back off probation? If you're higher than 8%, you're leading the country, right? We don't communicate to students. We don't communicate. People say we give them grades. Grades don't tell them anything about their progress towards a degree. Tells you what you got in a course. One of the things that I like to say about this, we're trying to change the unit of measure in higher ed from courses to programs. Because for centuries, it's been about, the, well, for actually in community colleges for decades, it's been about the course. The entire onboarding experience at most colleges, yours, my old colleges in California that I worked at, was to get that first semester of courses on the student's schedule, right? Your entire onboarding experience is about that list of courses for the first semester. And at some colleges, you do something after that, but at many colleges, you don't, right? You don't have mandatory advising every semester. Now it's up to the student to figure it out, right? So this is, we're trying to change the unit of measure here from the course to the program and actually monitor their progress. Right now, if I was to ask you, pull a student ID and give you their transcript and tell you you can't look at anything else, tell me how far they are towards their degree. You couldn't do it, right? Because you actually don't know. And by the way, I, I find degree audit an absolutely hilarious thing in the end, right? Degree audit's awesome. The system is so complicated that no human, student or person at the college, can actually look at a transcript and figure out how far a student is towards a degree and what they need to take next. We need a sophisticated computer program and an algorithm to help us do that. And we wonder why students are confused, right? Think, just think about how ludicrous that is. I mean, it's great because we need it right now. Until you have the guided pathways, you need degree audit. Because it is that complicated, right? But think about the, again, where a lot of this, you know, I, you know, he's a, what are you? I don't know, behavioral economist, I'm a psychologist. Um, I always come back to the psychology of this. You've heard it, our, the continually reinforcing to students, you should know this, it's about you, it's not about us. It all, it, a lot of stuff gets continually reinforced here and doesn't need to be that way. So the right side is required plans and requiring students from the start to explore a field of study of interest. And I'll show you an example in a minute, a couple examples. Default full program maps created by the faculty and advisors that actually lead with the targets in terms of further education and careers, specific job types clearly delineated so the student can see the path and exactly the sequence of the path. We'll show you an example in a minute. And they can see where it leads. It's, you're not limiting student's choice because it's a default. The student can change it and can modify it according to their needs and, and desires, but they can't change it on their own. They've got to come to a faculty member or an advisor, someone who knows, to do it. Um, student learning uh, 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 outcomes are aligned with the end goal requirements. Uh, when I talk to faculty, this is a big thing. Allowing students to choose from this Chinese menu of, you know, that we saw earlier of gen ed requirements, pick two from column A, one from column B. I mean, that is not a liberal arts education. And uh, this is very much about strengthening general education in liberal arts, not doing what we are now, which is just having students check off boxes. Assessing students, especially in the classroom where it makes sense by faculty to, to diagnose students' needs for support. And we're assuming that no student coming to you who's new to college is ready for college. Look at the elites at Princeton and, and Yale, and they have very extensive orientation. Most freshmen are taking one of four or five common curricula. It's all been very well thought out. But in you know, community colleges, we leave students who aren't as academically or more importantly, socially prepared you know, uh, uh, 
just figure it out on their own. And more and more, and more we want to integrate the, te uh, the support for students, the, the academic supports into the college level courses for key programs, not just in math and English, and we want to track students across. So there are a number of examples that we point to in the book and, and in the handouts that we've sent you. The, and, and this work really began in universities. In a number of these uh, institutions, Florida State, University of Central Florida, Georgia State, Arizona State, we've seen uh, movement in the numbers on student success. I think that's a really important point. At the end, if we have time for it, I have these 10 most commonly asked questions about guided pathways that we've heard all over the place. And one of them is that, we're, it actually isn't on there, but I, we still hear is, that we're trying to remake community colleges into technical high schools, right? We're going down this path of guided pathways. Everything's going to be overly structured. And it's fascinating that where this, the, the, the genesis of this movement actually comes from large four-year universities, right? Arizona State, second or third large, Central Florida are two of the three largest in the country, who are seeing that even for their students who are theoretically the top 20 or 15 or 25 percent of the graduating class, we take the top 100 percent of the graduating class. Um, even for those students who are at the top, they're feeling the need for this revised onboarding, for this structure, because their students are having the same issues that our students are. And again, given that we're taking the top 100%, we're going to have a vastly higher percentage of students who are first time in college and who are low income. It's going to be even harder for our students. But community colleges are, are catching up. Queensboro has been doing this work for a long time. It's a really good example of engaging the faculty in a very organic way, focused on learning. They have five academies with faculty and advisors dedicated for each. This is a big thing, dedicating faculty and advisors to a program area so that the advisors don't have to know. They know business or they know arts and humanities. They don't have to know health care, and, you know, and they can work more closely, which is critical with the faculty. And faculty, whether formally or not, are much more involved if they see themselves part of an academy or a program. Gutman College has, uh, has, will exceed its three-year goal of 35% graduation rate this next fall, uh, this next uh, uh, spring, uh, this spring, I guess, June. Uh, they, they're probably going to be in the 40% three-year graduation rate with uh, CUNY community college students. By the way, they have no dev ed at all in the first in their in their curriculum. It's all integrated into courses, which includes statistics, biology, college level courses that will are quality to transfer. City College of Trans of of Chicago. If you saw the webinar we did, uh, I've done a lot of work there. They've doubled the graduation rates dramatically and incre increased the number of degrees, focusing on paths to jobs and further education. So I want to show you, and you know, Rob talked about the Miami-Dade faculty, and um, I really encourage you to take a look at your own uh, uh, websites, because this is how students come to you. And remember, they're interested in two things. Number one, careers. Number two, degrees. So when I, I talk about biting the hand that feeds me, and I did clear this with President Murphy. I told her it wasn't pretty, but I've looked at your other others of yours. So. When you type Google uh, Brookdale Community College degrees, this is what you get. This thing talks about associate degree degree programs. There's that. So then you go to the catalog. <laughs> Message from the president. Of course, okay, let's look at certificate requirements. Associate arts. Okay, we start to get this list that looks like Associate of Science. I want a bachelor's degree. I don't know what the, these associate degrees are. I don't, uh, let's see, general education, where's that? Oh, here it is. Here's general, okay, now I, now I get it. <laughs> now it's easy. Nowhere on this thing could I find any mention, well, there's transfer. Any, there's no career information that connects it. So New Jersey transfer law. Well, good. I'm, I'm. There's a law. My responsibilities. <laughs> exactly. we all follow like laws. Gen, first, first instruction. Follow Gen Ed requirements. But I was <laughs> just there. I don't understand. The youngest person. If you ask the youngest person in this room, who's in their 20s or 30s, what they do when they go to a website, how do you search? Let's say, what would you do if you were to try to find psychology on a college website? You would go into the search engine and search for psychology, right? You know what's the last thing you want them to do on most of your websites? Is exactly that. 
right? That right there will be the last. I mean, you're lucky if you got this from, from what you looked for here. Because the search engine on most of your websites is completely useless. You know what you get in most, I don't know if this is true in New Jersey. In most places I look, what you get when you search on the search engine for psychology, you get board minutes. <laughs> you get all kinds of board minutes, and then you get like job advertisements, right? Not for jobs in psychology, but for jobs at the college in psychology, right? You very rarely get what you're looking for. The search engine, I mean, so, th and this is not about websites per se, it's about the chaos again. The website is another manifestation of the chaos. And by the way, we can pick on Brookdale, but 99%, people ask me what's a good website, because I do this whole website thing, and I struggle to answer it, <laughs> right? Here's one here. ASU is about as close as it gets. So when uh, you type uh, Arizona State University degrees, this is the website you get. Arizona State offers more than 300 majors, and they've made a huge push under Michael Crow to make sure that their programs are, are of high uh, research caliber and align with the, the needs, the occupational needs in the Phoenix metropolitan area. So we look under cool majors, for example. They're all science majors. I think, I think they're cool because you, can, you make enough money that you can afford to be cool, you know? So look under business sustainability and business anal data analytics and compare them. And so I want you to get a sense. So, so I'm, I'm two click, three clicks into this now. From all their programs to these two businesses that are side by side, it describes the two programs. And then it it's talks about second language requirement, no for both of them, thank God. Second language requirement and then math intensity. For both of them, it's moderate. And then, and I'm just scrolling down at the bottom of the page, but this is the next thing students look at, is the career information. And you can click down into the career. So right there with the program, right in the first page with these side-by-side -side comparison of two programs is the career information. The other okay. thing, whenever you're clicking through this site, go back up to the top, Davis, there is always a button for major map. Yeah. No matter where you go, you're one click away from seeing this, which tells you exactly what to take in what order. You're so never more than one click this away. Is a, for business, this is the university, business of, a Bachelor of Science in Business Data Analytics, which is a very hot field. We're trying to hire them all the time, and it's impossible. All terms laid out what courses you should take, where their electives, they, they tell you, they give you a small list of three or four electives. And there, uh, beside this, which you can't see, are milestones. What you have to do in each term to be moving ahead. Um, you see these, these diamonds are critical courses. If you don't pass these courses with a the grade indicated, a C or better, they will not let you proceed in this major because they know from their statistics, their predictive analytics, that your chances of getting a Bachelor of Science in Business, to, if you don't pass this with a C, are zero. They're, it's not ethical to let you move forward. They will do whatever they can to help you pass that course. And this is what I'm talking about, building in support into the critical courses. Anatomy and Physiology, Bio 101, uh, uh, Econ 101, History 101, his, you know, American History, your hard courses, Psych 101. So if you come in as the majority of students do to Arizona State and you, and you don't know which of the 300 majors you want to major in, you're required, get this required, to enter one of the exploratory majors in business, education, uh, health and life sciences, humanities, social and behavioral sciences. These are all, these subsume all 300 programs. And you go through a prescribed curriculum that gives you a taste of that field but doesn't lock you in immediately. It allows you to take, a, or tells you what other things you can take to get some exposure to other fields as well. And you're required to attend a required workshop uh, t developed by developmental psychologists, the goal of which is to come out of it with uh, a clear plan for what you want to major in, and then based on one of these maps, having a full eight semester or full term schedule. And this is what Davis was talking about earlier. They're not getting rid of choice. They're architecting it. They're architecting choice. What do behavioral economists and social psychology agree, uh, psychologists agree on besides beer, which we do? <laughs> um, we agree that, this, that humans, by the way, we tend to dehumanize students a lot and refer to them as another species. Like, if only students did this. If only students could make a decision. They're also humans, as we are. 
Um, how, many, how many choices can humans reasonably decide between before they get paralyzed? Five or six is the max number, right? So there's a reason you tend to see five to seven in the choices, right? By the way, it's why phone numbers have seven digits, like it's why, because you can remember that, right? So the idea, you know, the alternative to this, what we do and what Arizona State had before is the Cheesecake Factory menu, right? You got, a three, you got 600 entrees on there, and if you look at what people order, they order the same six things they could order at Applebee's, right? Because they're paralyzed by all that choice, right? So architecting choice is what we're talking about here. By the way, what does Cheesecake Factory do? They put tabs on the menu. There's about seven to eight tabs between the categories of food. So now you can see which category you're more interested in, and you can see the choices there. That's essentially what they're doing here. It's based on the same research. But before, in 2007, before they had these pathways, and the only way this happened at ASU, a research university, was that the president and the provost told the deans that they had to get the faculty to put these together, or they were out. You know, they didn't know which students were on track. Now they have a clear sense of who's on track and who's not. And actually, once you have these pathways, you can predict ahead of time how well a student is going to do, and therefore how much support he or she is going to need. So they're, and, and they've seen an increase in uh, freshman retention, uh, in first to second term retention uh, as, a, as a result. And to fuse this with another college, just on a data point, Georgia State University, which is in Atlanta, which we could spend a long time talking about what they've done. They've, by the way, probably the most transformational story of improvement in higher ed in the last decade. Gone from a 31% graduation rate about 12 years ago to 56, 57% now. With the same population, the same funding, actually, quote unquote, a more challenging population, which is always code for something. Um, they started with 40% African American students when they had the 31% graduation rate. Now they're at 60. And their graduation rate's gone up to 56, 57%. They have the highest, one of the few colleges in the country that has no so called achievement gap. It's actually flipped. African American students graduate at four points higher than white students. And they've been done this over a decade, and much of what they've done, although they didn't call it guided pathways, is everything in line with guided pathways. One of the favorite numbers I look at from them is they looked at their retention rates. You guys all look at fall to fall retention rates, right? It's hard to move that number. They've done a good job moving it here. At Georgia State, they look back 10 years when they started this, it was 81, 82, 81, 82, 82, 80, 83. Then they asked a second question How many of those students are academic sophomores? So they're one quarter of their way towards the degree. The on track that Davis talked about, what do you think that number was when they started? 22%. So they had 82. Only 22 out of 100 were academic sophomores. You look at that chart over the 10 years, it's now 68%. They've tripled it, right? That's how you, it's, it's this progress. We're getting students moving towards something. There's no silver bullet to it. It's everything that we've talked about here that they've done there. They've got more structured programs of study. They were doing predictive analytics before it was a term, right? Once you get down into the programs of study, you actually can do the monitoring. Right? You can see what the progress looks like, and they maniacally manage those numbers. They also, by the way, work a lot on unmet financial need of their students. We had, I got a toolkit coming out uh, in a couple weeks called Beyond Financial Aid, which is getting at the issues of stu for students beyond what can be covered by financial aid and what you at the college can do to work on those. Unlike his book, which is really well priced, ours is free, uh, so it'll be coming out. Just, to, I'm just saying, like you get more, it's longer. Um, coming out in a couple weeks, but this issue of unmet financial needs, big too, because it goes into all of this, right? Financial stability is a piece of this. But why we're so excited about ASU and GSU, and by the way, he's being incredibly modest about the work he has helped happen with the great practitioners at City College of Chicago. I mean, that is another transformational story of a college that really was struggling down at the bottom of kind of the rates. To, oh, in very short period of time, relatively five years, has moved their graduation rates a long way. And by the way, their website is a, is almost as good, if not better, than the ASU website. And so I think you showed some some of that before. Yeah. yeah. So what ASU has done is part of a strategy to, where they've increased freshman requirements to create more of an elite freshman class. They have built from the community colleges, not just in Maricopa and Phoenix, but throughout. Arizona, and now increasingly in California, because the California State Universities are tapped out, this pipeline. Uh, uh, Maria Hesse, our colleague uh, there, is, is, is working on this. And so this is an example of a web page of a student at Glendale Community College, one of the, who's on a particular, one of the pathways. And 
here up here is her ASU advisor. And down here is information on the, the Carey School of Business to which she wants to, in, in which she's on a path at Glendale Community Colleges to be on. And the dean is, and the people in the business school at ASU know that she and other students are coming through the pipeline to them. So they're creating essentially a supply chain from the community colleges. They found, uh, they did this because, in part because they found that students who transferred them without at least having done the, the, the statewide uh, gen ed core and especially get, or, and, and especially get an associate degree, those students did very poorly. In other words, students who didn't spend enough time at the community college and transferred did poorly. Those who came with an associate degree especially, they do as well as their native selective students, okay? So, you know, this is all about, about business. What's interesting about this is even in the other 47 states which don't have strong state transfer pathways, they built this between the two colleges, right? They built it in the absence of great state transfer policy. Um, I mean, it's a small state, but so the, whatever you're doing at the state level to work on transfer policy is wonderful, but there's still a lot of opportunities to build. You know who your three biggest transfer recipients are, right? My guess is those three cover 70, 80% of your transfers, right? Why not start there? You know what majors they're going into. Business is always number one, psychology out, yeah. is number two, right? And you need so, to get your faculties in those yeah. programs together. So what ASU is doing as, as the next phase of this is building these pathways down into the Maricopa schools. Because if we want students, especially low-income students, students of color, to be in the STEM programs, the cool majors, they have to be taking the right math and science in starting in eighth and ninth grade. But I can show you a website that allows students to explore, K-12 students in the Maricopa schools, explore careers, and then it links you to the very same pages, the pathways pages that we saw and shows the route directly at ASU and then through your local community college to if I'm interested in like business sustainability or business analytics and the like. So it, it, we want to finish by just showing an example of a college in progress, because to give you a sense of what's involved, um, this is Lorraine County Community College, which was one of the completion by design schools. Um, and last year, they really, uh, they, they laid a lot of the groundwork, but last year when they found that 60% of their students who graduated in the year prior were graduated in a field that was different than the most recently recorded SIP code, program code in their student information system. So in other words, students were graduating in programs that, that didn't reflect what the college tracked them through in the program that, that they were in. And they said, we gotta do something about this. So they have committed to a strategic plan that in involves things, these things especially improve college readiness, but a key focus on reduce, uh, time and cost to degree completion, encourage early connection to careers. And this is really important because it involves the faculty very instrumentally using this pathways as the framework, embed real world experiences, active learning across the curriculum, including and especially in the general education. That doesn't mean it has to be voca uh, vocational, it has to be active uh, learning. And so they put together these teams of, of faculty and advisors, and they went through the programs. This is a case of looking at, at business programs. And these are the courses that students can take initially coming in uh, uh, that, that in their first term that will qualify them for all 12, that will give them a taste in business, but will qualify them for all uh, 12 business uh, programs offered by the college. Now, a student who wants to proceed in accounting they take accounting 152, it starts to narrow their options. So they're creating these maps for students, uh, and I'll show you starting with the end in mind, but they're doing it in a way that shows students what happens to their options when they make particular decisions it, it, to move forward. This scaffolding is incredibly important. May I go back two slides, Davis. Yeah. I mean, think about that for a second. You know, one, that there's actually a list of seven courses that now you can take any of these seven. And by the way, they've got them on the maps yeah. now as well. And you're, you're good for all 12 of these majors, right? It's not so narrow that you have to choose on day one which spe how specific you get later on. Again, it's architecting their choice and it's scaffolding their progress.
right? This is also led the faculty to look at prerequisites. I mean, City College of Chicago, they found courses that were prerequisites to prerequisites, honestly. I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. And, that didn't, and in this case, they're also looking at uh, Cleveland State University's requirements. So it's not just the colleges. They're looking at what does it take for students to, to transfer. So this is the work that the faculty and advisors are doing behind the scenes. But starting uh, next spring, they're going to start requiring all students to enter into an exploratory major like ASU. And here are, their here are all their programs. This, this slide isn't up yet, or this uh, website isn't up yet. Their current website looks a lot like Brookdale's, maybe even worse. I mean, they have this alphabetical list of programs, and it's even bigger college. And so like ASU, these are all the programs so if I'm interested in healthcare, I click down. These are all their healthcare programs with, and they're gonna have YouTubes with information about health careers. And if I click down one more on nursing, that's three clicks to nursing. I find all their nursing programs, including their university partnerships. Right there, three clicks down. And um, then I click on associate degree in nursing. The first thing is career information. And they're going to have videos, and they're going to sponsor students. They're going to have students who've been through the program giving their testimonials and giving their advice. If you're a student, this is what I do. I would, knowing what I know now, this is what I would do. So, three clicks to all the information you need to know about this uh, program, starting with the career information. The curriculum guide is the map, which will look like Arizona State's course description, admission requirements, and then apply. Right there. So, uh, and, and once you know students are on a schedule, uh, on a map, you can much more easily create predictable schedules for them so that they can block their courses in the morning, afternoon, or evening, or on weekends, so that they can you know, organize their work and their child and, and family care around this. Uh, we think community colleges lose a lot of, how many, how many uh, co colleges canceled sections? this last year. What happens to students uh, who are, they could take an online course, they can wait till next year or next term when the course is offered, I mean they're screwed. Sorry, to use a Jersey term, they're screwed. Um, another key piece of this is that every, at every stage, this is the same, this is from Lorain County Community College again, Again, work in progress at those four junctures along this lost momentum framework. They're, they're, they're talking, faculty and, staff and student affairs staff are indicating where are we gonna talk about careers because careers and with transfer being a key piece of careers is what students are interested in. So this is how they're doing this across the, the lost momentum framework. I want to end, especially because we have university people here talking about what this means for two of their very successful efforts, a university uh, uh, partnership in which they offer three plus one in, in programs that are in high demand in the uh, Northeast uh, Ohio region and their dual enrollment program. About, almost a quarter of their students are in high school dual enrollment programs. But the, the IR, or Marsha Ballinger, the vice president, was telling me they get only 10% of those students, the rest goes straight to the university. So they're going to use these pathways to tie together their, uh, their uh, uh, dual enrollment and their university partnership program here. And they're, they're laying out for high school students exactly, this is a high school uh, 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 curriculum, what you gotta take in what term uh, to move and to get into one of these programs, into their three plus run programs, which as you can see are in prestige and high demand fields. Ashland University, BS in education. Hiram College has one of the highest ranked accounting programs in the country. Uh, University of Akron has a very well regarded BS program in sports studies. These are all you know world class bachelor's degree programs. But the key and what they're really marketing to students, to, to guidance counselors and superintendents is with this pathway, you can dramatically reduce the path of a student from high school to a bachelor's degree from these institutions in fields of high demand in Northeast Ohio. And in the case of education, you can be a teacher for 80% less if you do it this way. 
This is very compelling. We haven't marketed this in terms of, I know I'm economics focus, but, but and, and ultimately we want to have the human focus, but we got to stay alive and we have to get students in the door uh, to do this. And this is a very compelling way to do it. So well, we've, we've shown you a number of examples and there are others we can show you, but basically they follow a number of principles, which is build in career and college and further college exploration, goal setting and planning from the start. It has to, and, and it, Ideally, it can't just be something the advising and the career folks and the transfer folks do. It has to ideally be built into the curriculum. Simplify their choices with default roadmaps developed by faculty and advisors working with university faculty and departments and employers to create a coherent and academically coherent program of study that includes general education and, and, and liberal arts, but in a coherent way. And, and create a default map for students that they can, they can change and customize, but they have to see someone. Redesign the whole intake process, which is now effectively sorts out almost half of your students. Most about, in community colleges, 40 to 50 student percent of students are gone within the first two or three terms. Gone, and I mean not even transferred. They're gone. But redesign the intake process from orientation with the goal of helping students choose and successfully enter a program of study. Very different than what we do now, which is basically reinforce failure and lead student discouragement. We assume that no student is ready. So, you know, they're not ready. The question is, how are they not ready? And how can we help them to pick a path? And if they pick that BS in uh, data analytics, what do they got to do to pass that critical course and work with our faculty, our developmental, our learning centers people to figure out how to do that. Assess learning and improve teaching across programs, not just courses, and monitor students' progress. Once you know what students' path is on and what milestones they got to uh, achieve, uh, you can do this. Increasingly, colleges are uh, ASU and others are, are, allow, are relying on the student using Fitbit. Uh, Maria Hesse was telling about a, a boyfriend and his girlfriend were competing to see who could, you know, compete their Fitbit requirements quicker. I think that's a good relationship. That, that one's going to last. So, you know, we can create apps. And, but this is not about apps. This is not about websites. It's not about the data systems. It's about faculty with advisors sitting down across disciplines working with their colleagues in the university and with employers to say, how can we map out a coherent program of study for students that is educationally quality and sound, that will, really will prepare them for employment and for, to succeed when they get to the university as juniors? Um, and you know, how, can, how can we basically do this together? Um, one of the things that uh, my concern was with the guided pathways, it's a two-part question. Does this include the remedial courses that most of them have to take? Uh, because that's a big part of it. And how would you incorporate these remedial courses into the guided pathway so they'll be successful and stay on course? Really good question. This is about rethinking remediation to an idea where, again, the, the, the long-term goal is graduate and prepare for further education. The intermediate goal is to choose and successfully enter a program of study. In order to do that, you have to have help with choosing. And then to successfully enter a program of study, you have to pass those gatekeeper courses, which include math and English. So the idea here is, and we're assuming that the vast majority of your students are not academically ready. The idea here, like we were showing in Tennessee, is to build to the extent possible that support directly into the college level uh, program, into the coursework. And where it's not possible, where students really are not ready for that college level course, to create courses where they're really not going through high school again, but they're essentially practicing for that course. This is what Katie Hearn, our colleague in Yeah, I was California just going to say, I mean, the, the Tennessee data, which just came out, is pretty eye-opening, right? It, uh, it lends some support to the notion that maybe dev ed's a bad idea in general, right? What's interesting, though, is it's also because of the scaffolded support around the curricular course, right? So you have the transfer level math and English course and a required credit level co-curricular course that students pay for and it's required to take it. 
right? So it's not as if you're, we're throwing people into that transfer level course alone. What I think is fascinating about this is the data out of that model is strikingly similar in terms of success rates to the data that come out of Mathway, Quantway, Statway, California Acceleration Project, Baltimore County's Accelerated Learning Project, which essentially, I think about this now, the co-curricular takes the transfer level course and a support course, you take them at the same time. Quantway, Statway, all of the acceleration projects do one course first and the other course second, right? So it's really the same model turned on its head. And we, by the way, hopefully in 10 years, we'll be arguing about which is better. Well, one goes faster, one's in one semester. The other maybe has a more, you know, serial experience that can set up things better. But they both actually are interestingly equally effective. So I think there's two answers to your question. One is we need to change the system, right? We've known this for a while. The other system doesn't work. Right? It works for the students who we probably underplaced in the first place, right? Which these guys have great research on that. It, historically, and by the way, it's across states, we underplaced about 40% of the students who could have succeeded in the transfer level course, right? So, you know, we, we can take care of that problem too. The second question, though, I think is while we're getting to that model, what do we do early? And this is a tough one because you can see one of the things we usually suggest doing. Do the transfer, do the pathway, the, the, the major pathway, assuming that someone's going to start at the transfer level course, and then adjust it for those who don't, right? Now, now that's most of your students, and we want to avoid setting up sequences that have three semesters of dev ed before you do anything at the transfer level. So it causes you to, because, you know, again, math and English aren't the courses they're excited about. How do we pair things? If we're going to have those courses for now, how do we pair them with courses that give them momentum? And by the way, what those courses are, are not often intuitive. I've done this analysis. When you look at students two levels below in English and you find what are the courses they have the highest success rate taking at the same time, everyone wants to put them in the arts and humanities, right? Art history is one of the hardest courses for a student that's two <laughs> levels below. It had a 17% success rate at my college. You know it had an 80% success rate? I'll give you a bunch of guesses. Econ 1, which everyone thinks is a much harder course. I can come up with a lot of reasons for that, like right? theories like maybe econ inherently makes more sense to most people, right? Right? They're living it, right? They're, they're leaving econ on one level, right? But so if we have to do those things, we need to think about it. We need to think together about it. I think one of the things we talk about, one of the questions we absolutely always get is, doesn't this mean faculty lose control over what's taught in their discipline? Right? You're going to hear that if you haven't already with this, right? And the answer that we give back to that is yes and no, right? Because what the faculty gain is, let's say I'm the accounting faculty. Who knows better than me on the campus? Let's say you're just so it's not about me, it's about you. You're the accounting faculty on your campus. Who knows better than you what's the right s arrangement of gen ed courses to prepare someone to be an accountant? You do. You're the accounting faculty. That's what Sinclair did in Ohio. They empowered those people, right? Now, what it does mean, and by the way, if you're in the humanities, what are the best social science and general science courses, natural science courses that are best for humanities graduates to take? So it, what it does change, though, is the, the idea that I get to teach what I want to teach when I want to teach it in my own discipline. And we got to call this out really clearly because, frankly, that has been the model for, since the annals of time, right? And we are changing. This is where our friends from Public Agenda talk about engaging practitioners. We got to get people fired up about the, where we can go, that it's possible to change the solution, and say, here's one thing that changes in the process, but help us be part of the solution over here. And a couple other things real quickly on this. We're not killing the humanities. That's question number four on the list or something. We're not killing a liberal arts education. Davis alluded to this earlier. Right now, your students take what, 12 courses in their gen ed sequence? When we do a guided pathway, guess how many they're taking? 12. You know how many humanities take courses they're taking before as gen ed? Three. You know how many they're taking now? Three. It's not less humanities courses. It's the same number. But we're actually doing what he talked about earlier which is trying to think what goes together, right? Right now, there are billions of possibilities of your 600,000 gen ed courses and those 12 that they're going to take. And right now, we're assuming magically that they're arranging them in some way to maximize your institutional learning outcomes. This is the ownership part. You get to take ownership and say, I think this course goes better with this course. And by the way, I think they should take them in this order. And by the way, they, in North Carolina, there was all these you know, concerns raised by the faculty and advisors and others. One benefit of this, they found that more students were taking 200 level courses, which the faculty justifiably like to teach because they're interesting. And why were more students? Because they, why could they offer more of those sections? Because there were actually students making it to that 200 level. Yeah, exactly. So you confuse these two right arguments. Now, right now, 
you know, those are the courses. And honestly, that's, uh, you know, that's my goal is to get a student into a 200 level course because in those courses, the stuff starts to get interesting. You meet faculty. I know someone at the university. How do people get jobs? It's not through a pathway. It's through relationships. But you don't get those relationships in dev ed as well. I'm not knocking the dev ed people. Or you don't get those relationships. You get that with a faculty member in a discipline that you're starting to get interested in and that the faculty member, which we, they do all the time, we do take under our wing, but this makes it more systematic and say, I have a friend who's offering an internship in this industry. I think you'd be good for that. I strongly recommend you, you yeah, do that. Yeah, and those that. relationships aren't with advisors either, right? Yeah. I mean, advisors are great to kind of guide people in directions, but they don't know what it's like to be a phlebotomist versus a surgical technician, right? The people who know that are in, by the way, I once said that and then there was an advisor who happened to have been a phlebotomist. I'm like, what are the odds of that? Like, where's, how does that happen to you? Now, a majority of students, they have an idea in their head when they go into freshman year what they want to do. How do we approach a situation when they want to change their major? Part of this pathway is assuming that students will change their major. A big part of that is the exploratory major. It's an invitation to explore a major without getting, or a field, not a, you know, a set of majors like business has, it's Sinclair, they had 12 majors, without getting locked in. It will not lock you in if you take this in your first semester. And, and, and even so, second semester, we can tell you where you start to get locked in. And there is a process, a, a managed process, where if a student d decides that they don't want to major in business, do want to major in social behavioral science, the, that there's a agreed upon process by which they do that. At uh, Queensboro, I was just looking at their numbers, about almost a, between 25 and 30 percent of students switch academies. That's fine. And we find in research that students who switch majors, it's okay because they decide, I don't want this, I do want this. This is part of the exploration. Right now, the major changing is happening all the time. And by the way, we know where these are. It's from nursing to psych. It's from business to, to psych. psych. From it's from everything to psych. Yeah. By the way, um, the, second largest major nationally, psychology. 14% of the majors in this country are psych majors, right? How many jobs are there in psychology? No, they're jobs. They're jobs. One or two no, percent. No, 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 right. no. no. And the, they're but, jobs, but you need a master's degree. This is degree. my other point, right? You need a master's to get them, right? And how many students know that? This is one other answer, a couple other answers to this question. It's already happening right now, right? Yeah. So how is what you're doing right now preparing them to change majors all the time? Right? So it's not, because when they're swirling around, they're not making progress towards any one of those anyway, right? So what we're trying to do is change the default towards making progress towards something. That's one answer in addition to Dave's. The other one is, this is one that I, this is one of those epiphanies you have. I don't know where along the way we decided the only way to find out if you don't like something is to take courses in it. <laughs> I mean, it's highly inefficient, right? I got to find out if I like phlebotomy, I got to take a course in phlebotomy. Well, maybe someone could tell you what it's like to be a phlebotomist and you could pretty early figure on that, whoa, there's blood involved. <laughs> I don't want to do this, right? Phlebotomy means blood, but we don't know that, right? But th this, is a, this is a serious point, like why, because we do know roughly no career counseling. My old college, when I, was, when I was provost in California, I asked my career person, how many students do you see a year? She said 900. I said, great, we have 19,000 students. Like, that was up 20% over last year. And then I asked her, when do, we get, when do you get to see them? In their last semester, okay? So think, so those, none of the students at my college had any idea, and by the way, it was mainly CTE students and job placement. It wasn't about this idea of exploring interest and matching them to careers like the folks in Virginia do or the Education Wizard, whether they do it or not. Or you can see on these websites where part of this up front is about exploring careers. So it's still going to happen, right? And as David said, you've got to build the bridges. But I think the Lorraine example is the, one of the best there of where you start learning about one and you've still got a bunch of options. And they, by the way, made the decision at the end of that they don't want any of those. So they are going to have to move somewhere else. But again, that's happening now with even less preparation and less kind of thought on it. General studies is not a major. It, general studies is not a major. A major of field is something that leads somewhere. By the same token, I am absolutely arguing for the criticality of liberal arts. I am absolutely, and it needs to be an essential part of the curriculum. But that's different than the general studies curriculum, which leads nowhere. Where, what do you, what do you, what, uh, when you take a general studies, associate in general studies to a university, 
what do you get? They, they make you take a bunch of pre-major courses. You have to take a bunch of additional courses. If you take an associate or even a bachelor's degree in general studies to an employer, what do they say about it? What the heck's this? So that's not a program. Um, but, but at the same time, what we're talking about is building in the, the liberal arts and the critical thinking, which is need, and the, the, these kind of key fundamental skills that are needed both for higher education and in the workplace more coherently in the curriculum so that students see part of it and really focusing a lot more energy on teaching those well in a way that's relevant. With the guided pathways, I mean, I like the idea of being able to track how many students are on track and how many are not on track. But how do you take into account part-time students and students who fail courses who get off track? Great question. It's question 11 in the top 10 because I need to add that. For part-time students, the map is the map is even more important maybe than full-time students. Full-time students are there. They, have, they can have more time for advising from faculty and advisors, and we know that. They need to know what they're going to take. The other thing is I think that many students are part-time because they don't realize the implication. We're not doing students a favor letting them enroll part-time if they're never going to complete, and we can show you the data. Um, we, and also, this gets at the scheduling issue. We think not all students can attend part-time, but many more can. Many more students who take 12 credits, because we say it's, that's what financial aid allows, could take 15. If they take 12, they can't graduate in, in two years. Many more could take 15. So we have to think, and, but students don't know the implications because they've never had it laid out in a full pathway. So yes, we have the colleges who do this create pathways for full-time students. All of which, most of which involve integrated remediation, ideally integrated in a co-requisite way, but at least in a, in a purposeful way. Um, and they create part-time, but the part-time are usually half-time because less than half-time, you know, it's fine if you're a course taker, but if you're trying to complete a degree, I'll show you the statistics, your chances are almost nil. And if we schedule the courses well so that students can predict ahead of time for next term and next year, when my courses are going to be, I'm much better able to manage my, my family care and my shift work around that. Yeah, I mean, I think the two, just to support it, I mean, Sinclair in Ohio, when, when they did this process where they redesigned all their programs within a year to be more structured, they had a two-year and a four-year pathway. So they had a half-time pathway. The other example is another college he works with, St. Petersburg, who does what's more of a stacked approach, which is they just list the courses in order from 1 to 21. Yeah. Right, so if you're, it gives more flexibility. I get a little nervous about that on some levels because it, it starts getting a little more like what we do now. But at least it's the 21 courses in a row, so then part-time students can see. And I, we were, I heard the comment up front. They don't have time to waste, right? You can't make a mistake choosing courses as a part-time student and actually get through. So I, I mean, I couldn't agree with Davis more on that. It's actually more important for them to be on a path. Because otherwise, they're just taking courses and they're never going to get anywhere. And I think it leads to a lot of the statistics. The other answer, question, part of your question was about what happens when I, you know, I don't know if you guys knew this, that we don't have 99% course success rates, right? We have 65, 70% course success rates. I think this is the single toughest question in, in, in all of the pathways work Except that we, we do. Would say There's what answers. Okay, but what, I would, would say, what do you do you. now? Because we know, what do we do now is the question. Yeah. Yeah. So it, retaking it with no advising. Yeah. Maybe it's not even the right course. So two things I would throw out there for this one. One is the way we use summer. Um, summer is a largely underutilized resource in a pathways model because it actually gives you a chance to catch students back up. Right? Gives you a chance to catch students back up, but it requires partially the second thing I'm going to mention, which is going to make you slightly more nervous, which is the notion of independent study actually getting students back on path. Because again, we're assuming when a student gets a D or withdraws from a course in the 11th week, that they need to take the whole course all over again. They may have gotten that D because they had one concept they didn't get. This requires a little bit of a different way of thinking, but I think we need to explore it more as an alternative to get people back on path. If you've got someone who's got a 3-5, right, they're completely on path, and there's one course that they can't pass, Having them retake that course over and over is probably not going to be what they need, right? They need something different. And so, you know, if you want to see this as the fusion of competency-based education into our world, it's one way we could use it to our advantage very strongly. It requires a different mindset from faculty to think about what a D actually means in their class. 
It, it isn't 62 out of 100 possible points. It's what is it they can't do that would get them back to achieve the outcomes of the course. Yeah. If a, if a student currently gets a fails or even gets a C or a B in a B minus in anatomy and physiology and bio 101, they're not going to be in your nursing program. In this model, the faculty, nursing and other, have agreed. And you saw that the minimum grades in those critical courses. If a student isn't passing that, they're not going to be a nurse, but that doesn't mean they can't get a college degree. We help them onto another path, either a clinical or non-clinical path in healthcare where they can get that degree. And we work with them very care closely on the skills where they're, where they're weak. If they're really weak in science, then they're not gonna be a nurse, but there's, that doesn't mean they can't have viable roles in healthcare. But right now we're just letting them take that course over and over again, bang their head against the wall. And there's, we know, just looking at their grades, they're not going to get in. So this is a more managed way. How does the guided pathways change the face of the student success courses and orientation? It's not enough just to offer this in one one-off course. This really builds responsibility, actually, more both informally and formally into the program, into the academic departments into the faculty who are the people who have the connections. And in every case where they've done this, they've embedded faculty or advisors in those program areas, as I suggested before. So uh, at City College of Chicago, on the application, you're forced to choose one of 10 career and college focus areas. In the orientation, it's all about your career and co co focus area. In the first advising visit, it's all about that. Is this what you're sure you want to start on? Then you take a student success course in that field that introduces you to careers and, and majors in business. And, you, and, and in the curriculum, as the faculty develop it as a program, you're constantly reminded about it. So this is not a one, this is an ex, this is guided exploration. It's not one, if you think this, this is going to work with a one credit, even a three credit course, it ain't going to work. But I will say this, it does change the focus of those courses, right? So if I was to ask you, what's the one thing that's changed at your college in the last five years? A lot of you would say mandatory aeration, mandatory student success course. To which I would ask, to what end, right? What is the, what is the goal of those those features you have in your system, which I think is where your question is going. You need to integrate this into it. Like orientation cannot be about here's where the library is. That's important, but it's not really, you need to tell them that in a three hour get to know you session, right? Um, the, the idea is that these are levers and tools in your toolkit to help this overall process. It has to start before then, right? When I, when at, I, when at Arizona State, the, yeah. the goal of the student success required workshop that I mentioned developed by developmental psychologists is to develop a plan, decide on a major, or at least decide within a term or, or two what I'm going to major in. That's the outcome, to develop a required plan. So the whole thing is focused, right. or a key outcome is focused on that. It's not just, oh, I took the course, uh, well, hopefully you benefit. No, there's a concrete product, which is, this is my plan. And you know, the question I often ask people when they talk about mandatory, which I, by the way, I'm a big fan of mandatory orientation for the right purpose. How much do you think your graduation rate is going to go up because of mandatory orientation? <laughs> right? No one ever will say an answer over 1%. And they will barely give an answer over 0.1%. But I was so just. It obviously suggests it's not enough. It's one piece of another pie. But it's but an it underutilized thing. I was just Absolutely. at Jackson State University where they put all the stuff that they used to do with registration or in orientation online and the information about the library. And they got some of their best professors in areas and, and organized students by the, their initial area of interest. Best, most exciting professors and people from uh, employers in these fields talking to students and their parents about careers in business, about careers in social and behavioral sciences, which by the way, we are, and there are lots of jobs in that area. They just require master's degree, many of them. And to, to, to get your best faculty there to get across to the students, this is gonna be challenging, but it's different than high school. It's exciting. Right now, what do we do at orientation? Here's the library, fill out these forms. You know, it's like a cattle drive. I'm sorry. Hi, I just wanted to say that it's, uh, for me personally, it's very exciting to be here today and to hear these uh, ideas and proposals. Uh, the one thing that I heard that I'm most concerned about, and this is a request more than a question, 
uh, is the uh, scaffolding that's going to be around these introductory courses, how we overcome the, the, uh, the remedial yeah. question, the remedial problem. Uh, I would love to see examples of those. Um, I would really like to see how they're organized. Um, details on that kind this of thing. This is the cutting edge. And when I mentioned Tennessee, this is precisely the question. Because honestly, we don't know. Yeah. But this is what, it's not going to be researchers like us. It's going to be faculty and advisors figuring this out. The preliminary evidence and, you know, uh, evidence from good, well-taught first-term courses is that it can make a huge impact. We have to figure out how to do this systemically. In my view, that once you get a student hooked in that course, they're on their way to the 200-level course. I'm not worried about them. They're going to be fine. But we, we have to focus our intellectual energies. I'm saying you guys do, because it's not going to be. We don't know. I'm going next, uh, tonight, to St. Petersburg to meet with uh, St. Petersburg College, Valencia, and Broward. All three have been doing pathways for a long time. This is precisely the question that they want to answer. I don't know the answer, but um, I can hook you up with the folks there because they're grappling with it. And, and this is really where, you know, in terms of community college education, I think we have the chance to really show universities and others and the the world, what we can do. An intentionality to hitting that process head on as part of this larger movement, right? Not as its own thing to be independently solved that is something that then you feed into the other. And I think that therein lies part of the answer, right? The fact that it's integrated. But I, I mean, I agree with Dave. We, we've got some early data, right? We've got some, some leaders who have done great things. I don't think we know enough yet about what the secret sauce is on that, that piece you're talking about. But again, the, the intentionality with which you and others approach that we're going to have a very rich data set in a couple of years on it.